peppered seven times uh, throughout the Bible's New Testament from uh, Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 to Peter's letters from the Gospels all the way to uh, Paul's uh, letter to the Romans chapter 10, there is little doubt that the earliest believers found Isaiah 53 to be fundamental to our Christian understanding. Isaiah 53 itself tells how the servant of the Lord's purpose was to reconcile people into a very real and vibrant relationship with God through atonement. Atonement, something that I will define and discuss a little later. It's been said that without knowing it, most Christians could quote at least part of Isaiah 53. Could you? And it's been said that at the very least, Isaiah 53 is etched on every Christian's heart. Is yours. So first, a little bit about the book of Isaiah and the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is one of two major prophets, the other being Jeremiah. The book of Isaiah is a collection of oracles, a collection of reports, poems, and prophecies. Now, these were given to Isaiah within a historical context and uh, proclaimed to the nation of Israel, proclaimed to the city of Jerusalem, and proclaimed to the kings of uh, the nation. What's that historical uh, context? The entire northern kingdom of Israel had been carried into Assyrian captivity by the year 722 BC. And the southern kingdom of Judah was in the middle of its own idolatry, sin, and evil. The Syrian empire was the initial threat to the Jewish kingdoms of Israel and Judah. The Babylonian empire would become the second and final threat, carrying the nations and the peoples into captivity. Because of the nation's idolatry and disobedience to God, God would use these pagan empires to discipline an errant Jewish nation. And to refer back to last weekend's uh, message, if you were here, God, who is holy, would return an errant nation back to holiness. Though the book of Isaiah can be outlined in numerous ways, For our purposes today, to better understand Isaiah 53, the first half of Isaiah could be understood as the book of judgment, and the second half of Isaiah could be understood as the book of comfort. It's within the book of comfort that today's scripture, Isaiah 53, is found. The name Isaiah means God saves. Isaiah was the son of Amos, and because we know this, uh, there is a probability, it's probably, I'm sorry, because Isaiah's was re- father was Amos, we know that he was probably also related to King Manasseh, which uh, therefore puts Isaiah in the royal circles of, uh, of the royal court as well as the priestly circles of the temple. Isaiah was married and had two sons. Isaiah prophesied for several decades, and these decades included the reigns of four kings, King Uzziah, King Jotham, King Ahaz, King Hezekiah, and King Manasseh. And with all of that, I now introduce to you Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. 
And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor had any deceit in his mouth. Yet it, was the Lord, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, by, by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made his intercession for the transgressors. This is God's word to us this morning. So I've shared with many of you before that when I uh, was a junior higher, uh, I was a basketball player. That was my thing. Um, I started playing basketball uh, during recess in fifth grade, and the school district that uh, I went to um, was six, uh, middle school was sixth grade through eighth grade. So I immediately, uh, after fifth grade, tried out for the basketball team, made the team, and um, it was... Um, Unlike today, there wasn't any travel teams uh, and, and, and club teams and that kind of thing. But um, we had a very, I would say, um, aggressive coach. Uh, he had, was a former um, professional football player, and, um, and this is terrible. I forget his name, um, and there's maybe reasons for that. But the thing about my basketball coach, he was a former professional football player, and he had a Super Bowl ring, So, and I think he was a lineman. So... You can Google that later and figure that out for me. Um, and but he he was he he had plans for us, and so uh, it, it, our team played year round like a travel team, and he wanted us to be good. So he would take us all over San Fernando Valley, um, South Central. I mean, he took us into Orange County. He took us to a bunch of places so that we played better teams, so that we would be the best team ever um, for the for, what was it, La Cañada uh, FIS, uh, Foothill Intermediate School. Um, so uh, I remember Saturday mornings, my mom would drive uh, me down the hill and drop me off in front of the school, and we would load up into the coach's van. He had a van, um, but it couldn't take the whole team, so there was usually one volunteer parent uh, each weekend that would uh, drive the rest of the team. And we would drive off. Now, in junior high, you don't know where you're, you don't know where was where and what's what and how long it takes or anything. So part of the routine was we'd have brown bag lunches and we'd get in the car and this was before cell phones and video players in the car and all this kind of thing. So we would, uh, wow, video players. How about DVD players? <laughs> Live streaming. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. And uh, so we'd get in the car and like, you know, you get on a freeway and you're junior high, you don't know where you're going. And about 10 minutes later, you're absolutely bored. So we, right, you know, it's, it's eight, 15 in the morning and we're already digging into our lunches so the memory i have is that we're heading down this freeway we're, we're, we're flying down the freeway and i'm in the back bench of the van and you know very quickly we've broken into our lunches we're eating our lunches and so on and uh there's a kid sitting up in front of me um and i think it was the coach's son i remember his name his name is derek and he takes his brown bag lunch it's empty now and he crushes it into a ball and he looks over me and kind of you know gives me the nod and I'm like nodding back I have no idea what he's going to do and he has those windows that you unclap and they, they pop out right and he pops it open and he takes his bag and looks at me and drops it out and I was like oh so all of a sudden here's the next thing though he pulls out a button now there was no star but this is a Starbucks Frappuccino there was no such thing as Starbucks back then but there was thing called juice, grape juice in bottles like this. And, um, and he looks at me with the bottle and I'm like, uh-huh. And he hands it to me and I'm like, uh-huh. And so, and I'm on the back of the van and I pop the window and you know, coach is driving, we, there's you know, all this stuff going on. And I'm like, I can't tell you 
as a junior high boy, how felt it good to slide that bottle through that little crack. You know how like you drop mail through the slot and it just kind of goes? I was like, yes, this is going to be awesome. So now all the boys in the back of the van are looking out to see what's going to happen. And, the ba- and, the, and, and, and the, it drops through that crack of the van and it drops down. And I'm looking out, I'm, I'm looking out the van this way and the bottle drops through and it was... It was, it was, a, it was like a, a, a miracle of physics because the bottle fell down and it was empty like this one. And when it hit the concrete, you would expect it to shatter. It didn't. Somehow it, it hit at full speed. It hit the concrete. And I think it hit like the corner right there because it went boom. And then it went whoosh, and it like bounced. Glass bounces. Who knew? It, it, it goes up and it's like slow-mo. Oh, like eight feet above in the air and we're all like this is awesome and there's a car behind us but the car goes underneath the bottle I'm like oh my gosh this is a beautiful thing Wah! and then it lands and it goes Psh! and it explodes and we're like ah! and this was awesome so okay now that the game is on right so then I, I look over and we're all just like yes this is awesome coach has no idea he's just driving down the road so the next thing the same kid drinks like now he's he's got a second drink he's like <laughs> and he hands it to me now this time it's like halfway full and i'm like we're doing it again and we're like ah this is gonna be great and i drop it through the crack now this time because i think it had stuff in it it just dropped straight down like a rock and just went Poosh, and exploded we're all like ah and then we see the cop car right the, the 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 blue and red lights come coach is getting pulled over he's like what's going on and you know he's looking and, and we're all just like silence we get pulled over now this is where and it may have been so like traumatic to me i don't have a memory of it i just kind of remember the cop stopped us he walked away got in his car drove away and the moment he was out of sight coach turned around and just rah, 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 just totally started yelling at us i have no idea what he said and the thing about coach because he was a professional football player like when he coached us, he was always yelling at us. Rah, rah, rah. He was, so when he was mad, and he had a right to be, all I'm saying is we were so used to him yelling at us on the, on the court and at practices and stuff. When he was yelling at us, we all just did what we did as players. We just checked out. And, and it was a very quiet ride to the rest to the game. Now, why was he so mad? Don't answer that. Because 25 years later, fast forward, 25 years later, one of two awesome youth pastors at this church is driving a 15-passenger van to winter camp on a Friday night in traffic on the 10 freeway. And as I'm driving the van, yeah, it's me, I'm driving the van and music's going on and kids are talking and it's all great. But if you've ever been on the 10 going eastbound on a Friday night, it's, it's, yeah, it's terrible, right? It's absolutely terrible. We're speeding up and then you kind of get up to 55 and then you're like, ah, break, because then now you're going like three miles per hour. So it's just stop and go and hit and, and, and there's music and we're all having fun and so on. Now, I don't, it's a, we don't have 15 passenger vans anymore, um, but we did and, way back in the bench in the back i don't know what they're doing back there and there's some junior high boys now they didn't have fidget spinners back then and they didn't have cell phones but what they did have was laser pointers so they're in the back of the van and they're laser pointing people they're trying to get people in the eyes and traffic well i don't know this so i'm just driving along and sure enough well and this is just when like cell phones were becoming a thing so somebody had flipped their phone, because later on I heard, I saw the lady with the cell phone flip it up, and she was calling somebody, and I think she reported your license plates because Highway Patrol pulled me over. Now, I've got 15, you know, 14 kids in the van, and I'm pulling over for the cop, and I'm thinking, I do not want to be on the side of the freeway in this traffic with 14 kids in the car. That just sounds like a mess. So I'm pulling over, but as I'm, I'm like, my anger is kind of like, wait a second, why am I getting pulled? Like, ha- I'm not speeding, it's, it's stop and go traffic. So I go, get off the exit, I get, get all the way to a parking lot, and the cop comes out, and he says, do you know that you were called in because there's kids in your van? With and I'm like, so I get out of the van, and I talk to the cop, and I said, are you going to ticket me? Because I'm like, I, I am not going to get a ticket for their stupidity. Right, and so I'm trying to like, are you ticketing me, or what? What are you? What's going on here? He goes, Well, I'm not going to ticket you, but you need to get those kids to settle down. I said, Will you do me a favor and scare the heck out of them? And he's like, Yeah. So, <laughs> so we walk around and we slide the door, the van door open, and all the kids are like, 
And I'm like, and he pulls out his gun and says, you're arrest. No, he doesn't. Do <laughs> <laughs> but like, like he, he gives them what for, right? He gets in his car, drives off. I slide the door shut. I get in and there's just like silence in the van. And then I turn around and, I, and as you know, uh, well, so I, I'm, I'm beyond angry because I'm sitting here thinking I'm going to get a ticket. I'm going to get a point against my driver's license. I'm the one who's all these insurance issues, you know, everything's going to go wrong in my life because some idiots in the back of the van are getting into trouble, right? So I let them have it. And then I'm thinking, oh, wait, I've been here before. <laughs> but I let them have it. I, I was beyond angry. And, uh, and they knew it. And, uh, and that ride to the rest, you know, we had about 35 more minutes before we got to camp, was absolutely quiet in that van. Now, why was I so mad? Don't answer that. So let's pause for a second. Let's pa take the van stories and kind of put them on pause. We are making our slow descent and approach to Isaiah 53. And like LAX, there's two uh, runways. Yeah, that's what they are. Hey, don't you love that? You're flying into LAX and you look over and you can see the other planes coming in and stuff. We're, we're going to go over here. Um, and we're going to land in Isaiah safely in Isaiah 53. And when we're done, uh, you're going to exit through the back and through the side. Okay. Um, okay, over here. The other approach. What is going on in Isaiah 53? Why is Isaiah 53 fundamental to our Christian understanding? To answer these questions, we must better understand the inner dialogue of the Bible, the concepts behind temple sacrifice, and as I mentioned earlier, what's called the doctrine of atonement. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Church of Rome, wrote, For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. And Paul did not just make that up. Paul did not just make that up. These words were his reflections and his conclusions based on an understanding of Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve willingly disobeyed God's word and God's will for them. Humanity willingly disobeyed God's word and God's will for them, the consequences of which are many. But the two that I want to focus on this morning for a moment are separation from a holy God and the second one being death. Separation from a holy God. God is holy. God is pure. God is righteous. God is truth with a capital T. God is just with a capital J. We can't, when we, <laughs> I was thinking about this early. Like we say God is awesome. And I think as Californians, we're like, awesome, dude. God is awesome. He's not awesome. He's awesome. He's like, we can't fully articulate God in his majesty. God is holy. And with the, the disobedience of humanity, we became unholy and unrighteous. And like oil and vinegar, the two cannot mix. God in his holiness uh, can't tolerate, and I don't mean like put up with, but they just don't mix. He cannot tolerate the unholy. He cannot tolerate the unrighteous, the unjust. And so a, a, a chasm is created in this relationship between God and humanity. And the other consequences, or the other consequence, rather, of the fall of humanity, the insurrection of Eden, is death. Adam and Eve had eternity with God in this place called paradise, Eden. But from once they disobeyed, they were cast out of the garden, and with that came their own mortality and came our mortality the consequences of sin is death. How can this one catastrophic event be rectified? Is it possible to right this wrong? Within the narrative arc of the Bible, foreshadowed by the sacrificial Passover lamb, which led to the Hebrew exodus from Egyptian slavery, the book of Leviticus outlines five temple sacrifices. All of them, all of them include the shedding of blood, the death of lambs, the death of rams, the death of bulls and goats and doves. 
And without getting stuck in the blood and guts of these sacrifices, oh, come on, blood and guts of sacrifices? Okay. On a primal level, on a primal level, there's a universal consciousness. On a primal level, there's a universal understanding that they die so that we will live. Let me explain what I'm saying. On a primal level, there's a universal consciousness or understanding of these things. We, in, in, in the Judeo understanding of Scripture, in the Judeo-Christian understanding of, of Scripture, with these bookends of Genesis on one end and Revelation on the other, we have this narrative and we have this understanding that influences our paradigm and influences our worldview of how we interpret our lives and how we interpret our relationship with God. But what about people that are outside of this narrative? Is this idea of sacrifice um, just something unique to the Judeo-Christian understanding of the world? And I would argue that Anthropologically speaking, the answer is no, it's not unique. That when we look at world religions, when we look at the span of the globe, when we look at the Mayans or we look at the Aztecs, there is sacrifice. When we look at religions like voodoo, um, which is rooted in African animism, there's sacrifices going on. Even in Eastern uh, religions, uh, there is sacrifice. Um, I've been known to partake in, in a donut or two. And I've been known to, like, go out of my way to find donut stores. I'm telling you, I like donuts. Now, I have been in donut stores, and maybe you have been in stores like this as well, where I have seen shrines with incense and, and food offerings, we'll call them, made to their ancestors for appeasement. And so... Um, there's a, on a primal level, there's a universal consciousness, a universal understanding, and I call it prevenient revelation, which is to say <laughs> that God, we were, humanity was created in the image of God, and there's something imprinted on us with an understanding of how things work because of that imprint. And outside of the biblical arc, of understanding our worldview. Even in other world, pagan world religions, there's this interesting element of sacrifice. On a primal level, there's a universal consciousness and understanding that they die so that we live. A sacrifice is made so that we are made right with God. That justice is served. Something is wrong that must be set right. Someone is wronged and reparation must be made. And now, let's define atonement. Atonement is a noun. The action of making reparation to a wronged party. The action of making a, re a reparation to a wronged party. Now, when I look at that definition, this is one definition for atonement. When I looked at that, the, the word I first zoomed in on was reparation. Well, look at the root of that word, repair. Repair. And then I see wronged party. Well, if there's a wronged party, there's, that means there's another party who's doing the wrong. So we've got multiple parties, at least two parties, and there is a wrong that's been done, and this relationship between these parties needs to be repaired. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Paul writes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the consequences of our sin is death. Now, the problem with the Old Testament atoning sacrifices is that they were insufficient. Insufficient. Insufficient because they were, it's almost like they were time-limited, um, seems like they had a shelf life, like they had an expiration date. Like, as m once the sacrifices were made for, for whatever holiday they were celebrating, it's like before they could leave the temple courts, they were already, like all of us, very shortly um, willing to compromise that relationship, that peace that they had made with God, willing to jeopardize the relationship with God. Somehow, solely the relationship with God 
having made the sacrifice that supposedly was sufficient enough to repair that relationship. Insufficient, because perhaps this is where, and this is where it kind of gets a little muddled, but perhaps the quality of the sacrifices themselves did not have the capacity to absorb the totality of humanity's sin. That the the sacrifice themselves didn't have the capacity to absorb the totality of humanity's sin and humanity's rebellion and humanity's brokenness. But justice must be served. So back to the vans. Why was Coach so angry? Well, why was I so angry? <laughs> There's a lot of reasons, I suppose. But, you know, people's lives were in danger. Um, but I, I can tell you for myself, and, and now that I reflect back on why Coach was so angry, there was just a sense of injustice. Like, Coach signed up for a lot of things. He signed up to, you know, develop a team, to work with players, to be the best team he could be for our school and everything else. I don't think he signed up for getting in trouble with the law because a bunch of idiots in the back of the van were throwing bottles out of the window. And I can definitely tell you that's, that's not what I was expecting either. I wasn't expecting to get in trouble with the law for hanging out with a bunch of youth kids and taking them to winter camp. But Jesus, on the other hand, that's exactly what he signed up to do. And therein lies the beauty of the atoning sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So on the night of his arrest, it's all pointing in the direction and it's begin to crescendo and it's the night of Jesus' arrest, and he's celebrating the Passover meal, right? A, a whole celebration of a sacrifice of a lamb. And he's celebrating that Passover meal with his disciples. And during that meal, he takes the bread, and he breaks it, and he says, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, he takes the cup, and he says, this is the blood that I will shed to s seal the covenant for you. And I, I'm sure the disciples are like, what the heck is going on? Whatever. This is a weird night. <laughs> and they get up, and it was a late meal, and they, and they, they, they start to walk, take a walk. And Jesus says, hey, let's go over to, on the other side of the valley to the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and let's pray. And they're tired. And, and he takes the three, James, John, and Peter, and he says, come pray with me. Come further into the garden and pray with me. And then he even leaves from them, and he starts to pray. And what does he reveal? It's not like, oh, I'm getting into a bunch of trouble for these idiots. No, it's just the opposite. My father, he prays, may this cup be taken from me, yet, however, not my will, but thy will. Jesus submitted himself willingly to the will of the father to make it right. And then he's arrested, he's abused, He's questioned, he's beaten, but ultimately, he's nailed to a cross. And hanging on the cross, Jesus cries, it is finished. Now, he could be talking about several things. One is his own life. It is finished. We may not like the prevenient revelation and the ugliness of the sacrificial system, but we can rejoice that when the Lamb of God said it is finished, the sacrificial system was immediately made obsolete, done away with, because the sacrificial atonement was fulfilled. The sacrificial atonement was complete. The sacrificial atonement was sufficient through Jesus Christ. We may not like the prevenient revelation and the ugliness of the sacrificial system, but without its beauty and the extent of God's love for us, the extent of God's love for us would be completely missed. So let me explain this in another way. It's like a punchline without a setup. 
It's like a punchline without a setup. Punchline. Get me my yellow pants. Not funny? Joke. There was a captain of the ship who was walking the deck, and one of the sailors runs up to him and says, Captain, we see an enemy ship coming quickly towards us and is about to attack. He says, very calmly, he says, get me my red shirt. The sailor runs off, gets his red shirt, get, hands it to him, puts it on, and they quickly engage in battle. The battle is fought, and the captain and his crew win the battle. And the sailor comes up, and he says, congratulations, captain, we won the battle. And he says, thank you. And he says, he says but tell me, captain, why did you have me get your red shirt? And he says, well, I've learned that in the middle of battle, if I am wounded in any way, if I start to bleed, it can bleed into the red shirt, but none of the crew will know that I'm bleeding, and you will continue to fight to the end. And he says, wonderful. Just then, just then, another sailor comes running up and says, Captain, there's a fleet of another 20 vessels, and they're, they're coming down on us quickly, and they're going to attack. And he says, get me my yellow pants. Oh, now it's funny. <laughs> it's like a punchline without a setup. We may not like the provenient revelation and the ugliness of the sacrificial system. We may even be all at once mystified and confused and in awe of the apparent injustice of it. But without it, the beauty and the grace and the extent of God's love for us would be completely missed. If Jesus just died on a cross, what would that mean? But in context, we understand the beauty and the extent of God's love and grace and mercy for us. Friends, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, is the final and sufficient atoning sacrifice. Mending our felt alienation from God, repairing our fractured relationship with God. Isaiah 53, verse 5, by his wounds... We are healed. 